So um, welcome to uh, the first of the uh, marine and coastal um, restoration sessions. This is really exciting for us because um, there's not been a lot of marine coastal representation in Sarah before. And um, thanks to some really great work um, from Jen Ford at the end of last year, we, we all got roped in. So it's great to be here and thanks very much for having us. Um, my name is Gemma Parandre. I am, um, among other roles that I have, um, the uh, coordinator for the Coastal Restoration Network and within that, all of the marine coastal restoration networks in Australia. Um, and I work with Ian and, and uh, a bunch of the other guys who are here from Trotwater. Um, this afternoon, we have a number of presentations from um, some really exciting presentations, actually, on some of the really great marine and coastal restoration work that's been going on um, from Peter, Adam, Ian, and Nathan. And we're going to be talking about adaptive coastal restoration and responding to change and implementing management, so how we actually take some of this really great work that we're doing and put it into practice and, and through management. So before I, I hand over um, to the to the other speakers, I just wanted to give you a bit of an introduction, actually, to um, coastal restoration in Australia, marine restoration in Australia, and and also the coastal restoration network, which I mentioned I currently manage. So. Um, in terms of uh, coastal restoration in Australia, um, Alyssa, who's here, has done, and, and her team have done some really amazing work in terms of trying to pull together a bit of an understanding of the marine and coastal restoration that has historically been done in Australia. And to be honest, there's really not that much. Now, the work that, um, that Alyssa's team would uh, has done has been based on the cost of restoration. So obviously not all projects are represented there where there wasn't costs or there weren't costs published. But we really don't have a lot of um, information on restoration work that's been done in the marine environment. So while in Australia we've done quite a lot of terrestrial restoration, there's really not been a lot of, of, um, of scaled marine and coastal restoration. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of what, the, what we are doing now, and this is probably along the lines of the fact that some of this work hasn't been published yet, um, there's some really exciting projects going on in uh, the shellfish reef restoration space, both in South Australia, Victoria, um, through some of the Nature Conservancy work, and, um, and the new project that's about to start in New South Wales, so that's really exciting. Um, but again, we're yet to actually see results from that work because it's only just started, um, and the work that's been happening in South Australia is still um, producing results at the moment, and it's, it's relatively early on. So there's still um, a lot of uh, knowledge gaps in terms of what we're actually um, doing in terms of, uh, of restoration in that space. Seagrass restoration, again, has, done, has been quite active across both Western Australia and Queensland mostly. Um, but again, there hasn't been a lot of projects that have been completed where we can actually see the success of seagrass restoration. So um, we have a lot of work in progress, or we have some really great stuff going on. But again, we don't actually have any results yet, so we don't really know how successful it is. Um, mangrove restoration in Australia is probably the, the most um, uh, uh, the biggest example of restoration that we have in the marine space in Australia, where we've been doing mangrove restoration for quite a long time. But it's been quite fragmented, so it's been very much based on restoring for offsets or um, looking at uh, uh, restoring um, damaged mangrove forests where projects have, have had to clear and then replace for offsets or whatever. Um, they've had to do f um, uh, from a legislative perspective. And, uh, and of course, it's in the media a lot at the moment, particularly not necessarily all for the right reasons, but the Great Barrier Reef restoration um, uh, project that's, uh, that has been um, started up as a, as a consortium and we all met um, earlier this year to talk about the progress of that. Again, that's relatively new. It's something that was only funded really from the start of this year. And in terms of coral restoration in Australia, we don't have a lot of examples of how that's been done, even though small-scale, um, very isolated, small-scale community-based projects have been done from a commercial, larger-scale perspective of reef restoration. We don't have that kind of information or that data of success. So the people who are actually working in, in, in restoration in, in the marine environment, coastal environment, have got a huge amount of experience, but that's not all necessarily from Australia. 
And they come from different backgrounds, from um, you know, many, many people are biologists or ecologists, some are geomorphologists um, or, or um, uh, habitat system specialists. And um, we all uh, have got some sort of experience in restoration, some, some more than others, but when it comes to actually looking at how that applies in an Australian context, there's not a huge amount of information out there at the moment. So in terms of how we actually try and improve this or how we try and leverage off each other's experiences, we, uh, we all met um, up at the end, uh, sort of this time last year in Townsville, and we had a, a conversation around um, the different networks that exist in Australia. So obviously the CIRA, we're all here because of CIRA. Um, there's the Australian Marine Science Association, the Australian Coastal Society, the EINZ. Those are those national or multinational networks that exist that should be able to connect marine and coastal restoration practitioners and researchers and managers. Um, but because of the size and the fact that they don't always necessarily focus on marine, sometimes that doesn't actually really um, translate through to, to a successful network. And then we have got a number of smaller networks that have actually been established just because of that need of being able to connect people. So people working with the, the shellfish reef restoration um, programs across Australia needed to connect um, to be able to work together on, on lessons learned and how to actually implement some of the practices that are happening overseas um, here in Australia. So the reef, uh, shellfish reef restoration network was established. Um, similarly for seagrass and um, more broadly the Australian mangrove and salt marsh network which looks um, at mangroves and salt marsh as a whole but also has a restoration component as well. So we've but those networks don't necessarily interface directly with those larger networks. And um, often, as many of you in this room will know, when you're restoring a marine or coastal ecosystem, it's never really in isolation of others. So there's a need to be able to collaborate with other people who are working in marine restoration that aren't necessarily an oyster reef um, specialist or aren't necessarily a mangrove ecologist to be able to get best results and best outcomes for your projects. So we saw that as a missing link. So at the inaugural restoration, coral, uh, coast, uh, Coastal Restoration Symposium last August, um, we all met up to talk about our projects that we have been doing over the years. And it was really interesting because there was quite a few occasions where somebody would present on a project. This is an uh, interesting case between um, Peter Harrison and I, and we realised that like ships in the night, we worked pretty much on the same project, but six months apart and had never met. And that was the case for a lot of um, for a lot of people where uh, projects were going on um, in various parts of Australia or various parts of the world, but they didn't realise that somebody else was also working on something very similar. So we all came together and made the decision that a network that kind of was that intermediate level between the um, smaller ecosystem specific restoration networks and the larger, more broad um, restoration or environmental networks was actually really necessary. And that's how we decided to uh, form the Australian Coastal Restoration Network. It wasn't intended to replace any of the existing networks, but really just create that link between the networks. Um, it could, was designed, it's been designed to connect different disciplines, so it's not trying to um, promote one over the other. It's sort of saying if you've got a reef, uh, uh, um, a shellfish reef project that maybe has the need also for kelp, we can also um, connect those dots as well through, through that network. And it's a means uh, for professionals who are working and who are interested within and interested in coastal restoration to actually be able to work together as well. So it's a work in progress, and uh, and and um, we, if you're more if you're interested to know more about it, there's a symposium report that was published um, at the beginning of this year, um, and uh, and that kind of provides a bit of the direction of what we came up with at, in that conference. Um, if you want to, um, if you want to also learn more, we do have a website. Um, it's uh, still, again, a work in progress, but please uh, go and have a look, and you can come and join the network as well. Anyone, anyone working in uh, or interested in coastal restoration is more than welcome to join. Um, it tells you a little bit about who we are and um, and uh, keeps you up to date with the events that are going on around Australia. It's kind of like a central location to find out all of that information and links as well to all of the other networks and different things that are going on around Australia. 
Um, so that's all I'm going to say, and I'm going to hand over to uh, to Peter next, um, who's going to speak to us. Um, let me just get the title of your talk, Sexual Restoration of Coral Reefs. So the next uh, few presentations are going to be focused on some of the specific projects, and then we're going to have a panel discussion at the end to, um, to tie, and tie that all together. Thanks very much, Gemma. So... I'm going to treat this very much as a workshop and share with you a range of diverse ideas and hopefully that will prompt you to think differently and engage with us. I've got a diverse background as a scientist, as a manager of a small business, but I'm also on several not-for-profit boards. And if anything drives me, it's on a thalassophile. I care about the marine environment and our coral reefs and I'm trying to do absolutely everything in my power to make them healthier. Um, and that reflects in my values and the values of our company. Yes, it's all about people, but it's also about being brave and showing some leadership and being knocked down and standing up again, to being environmentally responsible, aiming for excellence, collaboration, ethical, and, of course, underpinned by good science. Every project we do has to have those characteristics and values or we don't take it on. So my talk's going to provide a bit of an introduction. It is going to focus on the Great Barrier Reef and restoration because we're involved in a few projects and they're all different. I'm going to talk about different objectives, not just science, but also tourism and conservation, maybe even politics. And because it's the Sierra Conference and on land they use the recovery wheel, I'm going to show that and see if you like it or hate it and encourage you to test it. And finally, encourage you to think about the questions you're going to ask these experts in the workshop. So there are many objectives of restoration. In my early days as a scientist, it was all about ecology. Now, having been in management, it's all about people. And if I'm looking to the future, it's all about education and the next generation and transferring that knowledge so they can build on the shoulders of giants. People talk about ecosystem services, ecosystem resilience, but I like this graph at the bottom, the triple or quadruple bottom line, you know, social, environmental and economic. Um, this is the only example I could find of the use of the recovery wheel, and it's in Mexico, and thank you very much to Claudia Padilla for providing this. It was a ship grounding, and she basically used the Serra recovery wheel to show the difference between the impact location and changes over time. And obviously the reef had recovered a bit and that there was more species composition. But personally, I found it a little bit hard to interpret. So, you know, you can look at things, but real knowledge comes when you test it. So I had a crack at testing the Sierra recovery wheel for one of our projects at Magnetic Island. And this is the way I put in the figures and what I interpreted out of it, both numerically and in words. So if you look at a wheel that's made up of 60 segments and the blue means good and the white means no score, I thought our project from a recovery perspective, and probably you needed to do a before or after, this is just a baseline, was a bit better than average, with the good bits being the bits on ecosystem function and community structure and the bits that were not as strong included absence of threat and species composition. So again, I encourage you to test the wheel, see if it works for you or not. Now that also got me thinking about projects and KPIs and how we manage and measure things. Because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And Peter and I probably do different things. And three years ago, reef restoration was all about ecology. But Margot Hine, um, a PhD student at James Cook Uni with a number of other collaborators said ecology is super important, but so is social. And in one of her papers, she came up with six ecological indicators and four social indicators, things like stewardship, for example. So I'd encourage you to read that. Um, anyone seen this before? 
the rare formula for change. It's a global organisation. It's a marketing group that tries to engage people in social change. And what I love about this is they've got the result in mind. Surely for restoration, we want a conservation result. We don't just want good science. We want a healthier reef. And this formula basically says if you go through this process and do everything, you've got a much better chance. But if you miss out on something, you know, this is where the science is, that absolutely has to happen. But if you don't have the attitude, you don't remove the barriers and the threats, you're not going to get the conservation result. So I'd encourage you to think about that. Remember, I'm challenging you here. And not only am I interested in science, but I run a small business. And this is the way business works. It's all about the customers. It's all about money. It's all about growth. Is that right? Is that wrong? Should we be using this in restoration? Into the future? Possibly yes. And this is a bit complicated, but when I first heard about the balanced scorecard at UQ, doing an MBA 15 years ago, it was a real insight. Because in those days, companies' annual reports were all about money. But the balanced scorecard also talks about staff happiness, customer happiness, and linking your visions to your key performance indicators. So I guess what I'm trying to do is show you a whole lot of different approaches from the scientific to the community to the business to start a discussion on how we measure success of restoration because I don't think there's any managers in this room, is there? No. They're really important people and because of that we've got three restoration projects. They're all pilot, um, they're all on the GBR, we've got one at Fitzroy Island Cairns, one at Magnetic Island and one on Agincourt. But look at the bottom. They've all got different numbers of key performance indicators. There's no overlap, really. Um, for the nursery and the outplant, they're different. For the one at Agincourt Reef, yeah, it's largely about coral survivorship, coral growth and stability. But the one in the middle at Magnetic Island, which was the first one we started three years ago, we worked collaboratively with government on those KPIs. And I'll show you those and get feedback. And how would you do it differently? And I'm also framing this in terms of the great big opportunity, the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, which on their website talk about ecology, feasibility and money. And nowhere in the world has anyone else put up, hopefully, $100 million for reef restoration to be spent over the next six years. So great opportunity. Um, so I'm asking you to reflect on those and whatever they decide to do into the future, links to our small scale and other academic projects. Anyone heard of pestle analysis? Yep, fantastic. Again, this was a real insight for me when I did my MBA. Political, economic, social, technological, environmental and legal. In my early career, I focused just on the environmental and I think most coral restorers do that. And then some of them do the social because it's all about people in terms of satisfaction, stewardship and capacity building. And there's some real numbers from our project at Magnetic Island and we're really proud of those that, you know, 97 or 98 percent improvement in those variables for that one little project. More proud of those than the ecological indicators which sometimes can take multiple years to even get the numbers. What about political? One of our keynotes this morning was really brave, I thought, talking about political. He was only talking in one dimension, the local mayor. Certainly in the space I work, it's three-dimensional. Local government, state government, federal government. Would you be surprised that I have at least one meeting a week with government and politicians and bureaucrats? And I believe that is a really essential part of doing business and you've got to prioritise it and make it happen. You've also got to measure it and report it back to groups like this so others can learn and possibly be more effective in the future in their projects. And in terms of legal, we all need a permit in order to do our business 
At the previous conference, Gemma talked about the consensus from that group of 60 experts was the two key barriers to restoration were legal and financial. And it often took four to six months to get a permit in Australia. Whereas in other countries throughout the world, like Thailand, you just do it. If you don't piss people off, you can start tomorrow. So there are multiple challenges and costs. And I'm just putting that up so not only can you think small, but I'm encouraging you to think big and how we can all work together for restoration and grow it in a transformational way because that's what we need and, in fact, that's what's going to happen. Um, I've estimated that currently in the GBR we're probably spending about 6 to $8 million in restoration over the next couple of years, and that's Peter and that's NESP and that's a few other private. If we go to $100 million over the next six years, that's a transformational leap. It very rarely happens. So we're going to have to measure it properly and we're going to have to get the right outcomes and keep the quality and a whole lot of things ticking over. Um, my main focus has been the bits that the academics haven't been doing. Um, I've seen a gap and we're trying to do restoration with people because, remember, people is one of my key values. So we're working with stewardship and we started this program in partnership with the Marine Park Authority, citizen scientists, using removal of seaweed to encourage coral to grow. And here are the KPIs, and this is two pages. And these were worked on in partnership with government. And they're very process focused, but again, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. A management agreement in place, and there was multiple. We had a plan, we had risk assessments, we had communication plans. We talked about the number of people we wanted involved in the field work that the tourism industry was engaged in advertising. We enumerated the number of communication pieces we wanted out. They were very keen of us to have a display in Reef HQ, the largest living coral reef aquarium. And they also said from a management perspective, it's your responsibility to produce a standard operational procedure because if you don't, then anyone else who wants to do it like you're doing it can't do it. So they were things that we took on and here are the rest, a couple of science projects, an amount of macroalgae removed, the percentage cover of macroalgae decreased, monitoring program in place, and we had a financial target for a budget. You know, it was such an urgent small project, we started before we got a budget, but we knew roughly what we would need for the personnel. So that's a real mouthful, and we reported on those regularly. And I don't think we got it really right, so I want to share it with you and collectively come up with something even better. Um, restoration as tourism, I think we all know the tourism industry in the Great Barrier Reef is worth around $6 billion, a huge amount of money. Um, in some areas that tourism industry is declining. I've heard in the Wit Sundays where they have roughly a million tourists per annum, tourism declined by about 20%. And it's even more challenging at the moment. Not only have they got cyclones and coral bleaching, but they've got tiger sharks biting people. So real challenge. But there are also huge opportunities in tourism to have them working with us as stewards. And what we've found is if you allow someone to do something positive, you can change their lives and the lives of their friends and family, and they can be more sustainable. Everything from reducing their ecological footprint to not using plastic bags, to joining a conservation group. So super important that we get more and more people involved in reef restoration. And I've heard it called edutourism, restu-tourism. Um, again, we've got to get more people involved rather than you know, 40 people in the room. Restoration for ecological resilience, bloody important as well. And all the small little projects need to fit in with the big projects and we need to have a plan about how we all fit together, as well as being innovative and adaptive and grabbing those opportunities when they happen. So my final slide is back to the pestle analysis and just to ask you to think about the question or the contribution you would like to make for this workshop. And I'll ask you to write it down. So in the next 30 seconds or so, you know, write down something you're comfortable with 
or something that you're really challenged with. You know, I'd love some questions or some contributions on politics or economics or the legal side of reef restoration. And if you haven't got the space in the workshop to ask me the question, email it to me or to Gemma or share it on Twitter. We as a community have to have a robust discussion in order to help each other, help the science, help the people working in this space and ultimately help the health of our global coral reefs. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, if you can keep your question uh, till the, we have our panel discussion, I mean, hopefully we can have some time to go through some of those. Um, just uh, do this. As you can see, I'm like much shorter than everybody else presenting. <laughs> So, okay. Um, so I hand over to Ian, who's going to talk about uh, oyster reefs. It's not all about corals. There's there's other there's other types of marine ecosystems too. Thanks, Gemma. All right. So um, some of the people in this room know about shellfish reefs, but um, if the, those of you who don't, these are mostly built by oysters, and that we generally refer those to as reefs or mussels and those beds. Um, and these are really the temperate analogue to coral reefs. So they perform the same sort of function in temperate subtropical areas. They tend to live in some of the sort of muddy areas and the warmer areas too. So they're absolutely ecosystem engineers. So they're the reef builders. Um, and they occur both in intertidal and subtidal environments. They used to occur at absolutely massive scale. So there's um, uh, areas that were fished for a long time, which were um, work beds up to 10, 000, in the 10,000s of hectares. And in terms of their sort of vertical height, um, you'd be struggling to find an oyster reef um, more than a metre high, or half a metre high these days, really. Um, but we do have some fossil reefs uh, in Port Stephens and in Bulgaria, um, which are seven, eight metres high. But uh, like a coral reef, there's a thin veneer of living animals on the top. The rest of it's structure built up from the old shells, sediment, and other associated organisms. So um, these reefs are absolutely... These uh, habitats are absolutely vast, and they've been um, fished for hundreds of years. In fact, I, I found um, records of the first uh, areas being overfished and closed in the 13th century in the North Sea. Um, they're fished because um, they're delicious and good to eat, um, and used to be easy to access, um, but also for construction materials. So, for example, in Australia, um, in the early days of sediment, we had a lot of issues um, finding sources of lime to build concrete for our buildings. So actually a lot of the Australia's oyster reefs got turned into, um, got burned in lime kilns. And um, if you scratch a building from about, built from about 1850 to uh, about 1930 in a lot of areas in southern Australia and along the east coast, you'll find little bits of oyster shell. Um, the peak years of the harvest uh, were really globally between 1850 and 1900. And the, the scale of the harvest is absolutely staggering. Um, for example, if you read any Dickens novels, you'll hear all about all the poor people eating oysters on the streets. Um, 700 million oysters consumed in London in 1864, and there's 120,000 people employed in the oyster dredge fishery. Um, however, this is actually dwarfed by um, Chesapeake Bay, so um, in the US, where they are bringing out um, dredging 2 billion oysters annually. So the scale is absolutely massive. This is one of, um, in Australia, similar patterns. Like Australia's first resource boom was actually oysters um, before the coal. OK, so what's the current status? I mean, these were you know, a dominant uh, habitat type in these temperate systems. Well, um, this uh, figure up here shows um, it's a global review in 2009, looking at oyster reefs. And um, the blue areas are good, um, and the poor areas are like less than 10%, uh, and the brown is functionally extinct. And what's really um, staggering is that um, overall the study found that over 85% of the world's reefs are, um, are lost, and that a lot of the remaining reefs are really in poor condition. So. Um, we certainly have the, the coral reef crisis now, but um, we've forgotten about uh, our great um, shellfish reefs because the most of them are gone before uh, our, you know, we were alive to see them. They were, they're gone because uh, they were overfished using destructive uh, fishing practices like um, dredging or skinning is a process that was used in Australia where a schooner would be 
um, brought up to an oyster uh, bank, and then they'll just um, shovel up all the oysters in the shell uh, and take them to the lime kiln, and that was the end of it, and they're still the same now, um, 100 years later. Also, uh, at the same sort of time, think about 1850, 1900, a lot of these areas, lots of land clearing um, and, um, you know, lots of trees removed for any of the terrestrial ecologists left, I know. Um, and so we got a lot of mud um, and land-based effects into local areas. At the same time, there was a lot of movement um, in general of stuff around the world, but along with, as well as uh, of bivalves, and that brought in a lot of imported uh, competitors, predators, parasites and disease. And that was sort of like some of the last nails in the coffin for these important ecosystems. Um, so along with being delicious and good for turning into wine, um, these oyster reefs and shellfish reefs in general actually have uh, really important ecosystem services. So um, they can boost local fish and crustacean fisheries. Um, they can improve water quality uh, through their filtration process. So they feed from particles from the water column and um, they uh, lay them down as feces and pseudofeces into the benthos. But they've also got a really important role in denitrification. Um, so there's been some studies that have shown that using mussel farming, for example, or restoring reefs can be a more cost-effective way to reduce um, nitrogen than upgrading a sewage treatment plant. They also um, protect shorelines by dampening wave energy um, for the intertidal reefs. And um, we actually know quite a lot about the, um, these services for the eastern oyster in the US. Um, and you know, they're worth up to, uh, just for those services, $100,000 per year um, for that eastern oyster. And um, the Nature Conservancy and Collaborators actually took that information. And the, we've got so far um, that you can actually looking at a restoration project, rather than thinking about, I want this many oysters, you can actually now go and use this cool um, system called the Oyster Calculator and go, these are the water quality improvements I want, and it'll tell you how many oysters you need to put into the system. They've got the same sort of calculators for fish productivity, and I think if it's not out already, um, shoreline protection. Do you know if that one's out yet, Simon? Yeah, so that's really exciting. You can check that out. We're not there um, yet in Australia yet. Um, there's been hundreds, if not thousands, of restoration projects over the last few decades. Before that, there was um, put and take. They put shell back down into old grounds and then dredge it out again. Um, and this had, this had the, the same issues that uh, um, chronic across all restoration types, lack of monitoring, objectives not being um, fit for purpose for the projects. Um, but We've learned from those mistakes and we're getting better. Um, so now there's a lot of uh, successful examples, really big government-led top-down uh, models, but also some community groups and um, small-scale um, successes as well. And uh, over it took us this paper saying that um, oyster restoration doesn't work. Um, and then there was another paper that came out later going, oh, we had to talk about it. We actually worked out that oyster restoration works really well if you don't immediately dredge it again afterwards. Uh, <laughs> In fact, they had one area in Texas, they spent $2 million in building a reef. Um, the mayor uh, decided that the watermen should be allowed to harvest, and um, someone's got a time lapse, I haven't got it, unfortunately, showing that reef being decimated and gone in 72 hours. Um, the other lesson learned was just make them like the natural reefs. So they needed a bit of vertical structure to get them out of the muck um, to have high survival. But it took 30 years to work those ones out. This is the largest... Um, uh, Biofab Habitat Restoration Project. Um, this is the uh, Chesapeake Bay Executive Order signed off by Obama back in 2009. And the goal there is um, to restore 10 Chesapeake Bay tributaries by 2025. Um, so it's actually for water quality rather than for the, the animals themselves. The first part of the project, um, they chose Harris Creek because it was already protected from fishing. And they did 142 hectares um, with built reef, either stone or shell, and they enhanced that reef with spat on shell if there wasn't a lot there. It cost $28 million, and that was um, highly successful. That worked. So now they're going to scale that up into the other nine tributaries. So what about in Australia? Um, well, actually, we, we've only really started to learn about Australian reefs. We published the first paper um, describing what are our habitat forming species this year. Um, we said 14. Challenge you, if you're interested, to have a look at that. I'm sure that's going to get revised over the years. Um, and we found that it was absolutely a, a, formerly a really dominant habitat type, and it was a really, um, really important, sort of the first thing that uh, Europeans did in Australia once they got out of prison, um, 
was um, start to harvest oysters because they'd probably come from the States or in, or in Europe where the industry was booming. Um, we had local extinctions, and um, for our two most important habitat-forming species, the native flat and native rock oysters, we're at less than 10%. For the native flat oysters, we've got one reef left in the world, um, and it's in George's Bay, Tasmania, uh, and we're still fishing it um, commercially. And um, so this is probably one of Australia's most imperiled uh, habitat types. But then we did a review as well. We found out that actually there's a lot of... Um, a reasonable amount of research done, but mostly it's focused on aquaculture um, and, uh, and describing species. And there's actually not very much information about services to know whether or not it's worth um, implementing these for some of the benefits we might get back. So over the last couple of years, myself and a, a wide group of collaborators have been just starting to um, fill the gaps there. And one of the first things we thought would focus on um, the Sydney rock oysters, those native rock oysters. Um, the Nature Conservancy have really been focusing a lot of energy on the flat oysters. I'm going to hear about some of those from Simon this afternoon, some really exciting large-scale projects. So we thought we'd focus on the, um, on the rocks. They're only found in the intertidal region now. They're functionally extinct in the subtidal, although they used to be dredged um, down to seven, seven metres, so, but they're gone. Um, I found uh, a few... Well, I talked to people. They didn't find them. People, locals know. Um, I visited uh, six remnant reefs, um, you know, between half a hectare and 25 hectares, and uh, just did some basic work to seeing what the density, the height, that sort of thing. Um, some of these reefs are pretty impressive. You can see that one in Port Stephens um, and Hunter River. These are pretty substantial structures, um, you know, up to sort of a lot of the, these ones are sort of 500 to 700 oysters per metre. And I looked at their, um, what communities they, they were supporting in terms of um, uh, macroinvertebrates. And remember, this is intertidal, so we can't look at the subtidal reefs because they're all gone. Um, and we found there's really high species richness, and there was actually five times the productivity of macroinvertebrates compared to what's replaced these reefs, which is bare sand or bare mud. Uh, and interestingly as well, there's 13 times the productivity of crustaceans, which is a really important food source for um, fish that uh, we like to eat. Something else we're really interested in Australia is um, the role in cleaning the water and filtration. And um, a lot of work in the past has been done on uh, an experimental situation where they have filtered water and they inoculate that with algae so they have a known amount. We were really interested to know about what about the, the normal water we have in a lot of estuaries in Australia now. It's really turbid. Um, you know, there's a lot of things floating in there. So what role are they going to have in terms of clearing this water? This video here shows um, nine native flat oysters uh, in, in one hour sped up um, versus none. Um, it's actually really amazing, the filtration power of these animals. We also collected the biodeposits and analysed those. Um, worked very, very fast, as you can see. Um, these numbers here don't matter too much, because I'm going to talk about that at a sort of a larger scale. But um, interestingly, the Pacific oysters are an invasive species, and I thought, oh, they won, they, were the, they had the highest filtration power. Um, but actually, the flat oysters, they're all subtitled, so they're in the water. 24 hours a day, so I think our native flat oysters were the winner out of those four species. But I'll come back to those results. Uh, we've also got a uh, PhD student, um, Francisco, who's working uh, in looking at what fish associate with these intertidal reefs when the tide's in. And uh, most people say, look, no fish are going to be found. Um, well, you know, this is not going to be a habitat. Uh, we used a large array of underwater cameras and at the same time looked at seagrass and salt marsh and some other systems as well which I won't present about today. Um, looked at two systems, Port Stevens and Botany Bay. So far, 35 species of fish. Uh, out of that, 11 targeted species from recreational commercial targeting, uh, and also mud and swimmer crabs. So um, this work's going to be followed up with some behaviour analysis. Are they just using it to rest? Are they feeding there? And also constructing a food web um, by using stable isotope analysis, including the shellfish reefs. That'll be really fun to couple that up with the macroinvertebrate productivity work we've done, see if there's going to match up. So you'll see those results soon. So I thought I'd have a, we don't have, we're not at the stage in Australia where we have the oyster calculator and we can work it all out, but we're starting to slowly build some of the blocks to get there. So um, recently, New South Wales Department of Prime Industries has got a $700,000 grant, um, and what they're going to do is they have all these old oyster leases um, where there's a lot of abandoned sort of oyster infrastructure, um, like rocks and old bits of stick and things like that. And they're all covered in oysters. And they've been spending millions and millions of dollars 
with the really um, unglamorous job of having to pull that all out because it's not natural. Um, and the argument was, well, hey, well, this is, we've lost almost all of our oyster reefs, um, and um, oysters seem to be pretty happy here for as long as they've got something to grow on. And we've also got these gigatons of shell, which is a waste product, cost money to get rid of. Can we not put shell back in uh, and enhance these reefs? So that project's going to kick off. And we thought we'd just have a little play with the number, some of the numbers here. So just for one, um, one of these reefs they're looking to target at, um, you can sort of see these lines here. This is where the old like rock lines and stuff are still there. It might be from 100 years ago. Um, and so, so what if we took it from that um, to that in terms of basically from like one ter third cover of oysters to two thirds? So that's like the natural ones. That's the remnant um, old leases. And here are some of the services and some of the initial calculations. You'd, calcul uh, you'd filter uh, the equivalent of 730 Olympic-sized swimming pools uh, per day and pull out seven, 15 tonnes dry weight of suspended solids and um, bring that into the benthic system and hopefully turn that into fish food. You'd have 600, uh, 60 million more um, invertebrates and that would be an extra productivity of 14 tonnes per year. Uh, and um, initial calculations show that would actually um, support a lot more tonnage of, of fish as well. So it's starting to build some of the blocks. But what about some of the other benefits? These are some of the benefits we need to put into our cost-benefit analyses. Um, but, you know, this, um, this picture down here shows the largest uh, flat oyster reef known in Port Phillips Bay, whereas previously it covered vast areas of Port Phillips Bay. That's the last one. And some of the projects that Simon's going to be talking about, you're bringing back an extinct ecosystem um, to the state. And what value does that have? So that's something that we really struggled working with economists um, when we're looking at frameworks, is how do you value bringing back an extinct ecosystem? We get it if it's like a bird or something like that, but bringing back an yeah, extinct marine ecosystem is pretty exciting. Um, we've talked, heard a lot about the restoration economy, and a lot of the projects in Australia, people are really motivated to implement these, not just for biodiversity, but for, uh, for jobs and economic opportunities. But I think one of the, the real benefits that I've seen for shellfish restoration is that um, it brings together a lot of stakeholders which have been in adversarial relationships in the past. So, for example, we've got recreational fishers working with conservationists and, um, and together in the marine environment. And we're really like, keen to not screw it up because at the moment everyone likes each other and we're all working together on something that's a win-win. So I feel a bit of pressure, um, but that, I think, is a really exciting thing. It's something new in Australia and it's a way to bring people together and work on something where you, we, it's got benefits for everyone. And um, I think in the future we can use aquaculture to get a lot of the same sort of benefits because they're still bivalves, they're still filtering the water, providing habitat, um, but there might be a role in nutrient trading. Um, we certainly know that there's a lot of interest in using shellfish and part of living shorelines and for um, uh, a climate adapted um, uh, piece of infrastructure because the oyster reef will continue to grow as sea level rises. Um, integrating with green engineering. And I really like to see what we haven't had in Australia is just a whole system approach where we look at using all these different types of habitats and fix up the catchment and just really go for it. You know, spend half a billion dollars on Port Phillips Bay and just, you know, smash it and see what we can achieve. And I also think there's a lot of opportunities for, um, we talked heard this morning about, um, you know, Australia being a managed system, including on land. So that really resonates with restoration. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to some more um, traditional owner-led projects, some of those are bubbling up now. So that's all I've, uh, I'll skip you that I'm a little over time, I won't go that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Um, so the last presentation we're going to have before we have our panel discussion um, is from Nathan. And I'll just bring that up. Nathan's going to be talking to us about um, uh, coastal wetland fish nursery uh, function in an agricultural dominated river catchment, 20 years of management investment. If what I a can. great title. It's, it's good. So this is a freshwater, less marine talk. So a bit different to the previous talks. You're on the, oh, yeah, you're on the cusp. Cool. Uh, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, I would first like to start, I guess, picking up on Adam's point about the value of having good communication and good network with end users. And my project, uh, the program, I guess, I'm fortunate to to be the investi principal investigator on, has 
connection with a whole range of end users. So not only lots of cups of coffee, but some great friendships uh, and some fruitful discussions and certainly without doubt respect and uh, cherish those relationships with all my end users. And the, the, the program and the results that are falling out really cannot be um, achieved without those relationships. Some of those relationships go back 30 years, um, colleagues in our group, so it's really important to make sure that you, uh, you value those relationships. So just wanted to, to make that point first up. So I'm going to be talking about not marine coastal systems, but these are a little bit more fresh, I suppose, estuarine, these transitional areas in the coastal habitat. And so these are the kinds of uh, uh, habitats, you know, salt marsh and mangroves that we, we do know provide really important habitat for things like fishery production, barramundi, uh, certainly crabs and other things that provide important habitat for migratory birds, for example. And it's the, it's the network of those different wetland habitats that is really what's so important. There's also a lot of interest around blue carbon at the moment as well and the opportunities that these coastal wetland habitats may have in terms of locking up some of the carbon sequestration rates. So, you know, incredibly value, valued habitats in our coastal systems. However, we are changing the landscape and I usually talk about urban development, that's certainly something that gets me quite excited, but for this talk I'm going to be talking about where we've changed the wetland landscape. Uh, wetlands are no good. We, we want to get rid of those and put sugarcane growing areas. This photo is from, the 19, from about 1995 on the Tully, which is just south of Cairns, uh, floodplain, where we wanted to get rid of a, a, a freshwater wetland, uh, straighten the channels there to get rid of all the rain. There's lots of rain there. Uh, get rid of that water and turn that into productive sugarcane land. So the result of all that is we've lost a lot of our coastal wetland habitats in the order of about 70 odd percent of our coastal wetland habitats in the Great Barrier Reef catchment. 70 percent have been lost. The remaining wetland habitats are degraded and experiencing poor water quality. So you know, the challenge is very great. A comment or article that came out last year talked about what's the value of the Great Barrier Reef. And this report uh, suggested that the Great Barrier Reef has a value to the Australian economy of $56 billion. $56 billion, that's the value of the Great Barrier Reef. Now, I'm a, I'm a simple scientist. I don't quite understand that seems like a big number. So I decided to put that into terms of what I might better understand, I suppose. So I went to the Forbes Rich List in 2017, and we have Bill Gates has a net value of $86 billion. Great Barrier Reef is worth $56 billion. Bill Gates just has a net value in 2017 of $86 billion. We have Warren Buffett, number two, $76 billion. Warren Buffett and Bill Gates could buy the Great Barrier Reef three times over. And to me, that sort of highlights, I guess, we're we really getting a good understanding of the value of these systems. The Great Barrier Reef could be bought by you know, one or two individuals in the world. It's crazy. We get into number five. Um, Mark's got uh, probably just enough money to buy the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so he might need to have bread and water for a few days, I guess, to sort of uh, recharge his accounts. And poor old uh, the Commander in Chief, um, uh, the US President, uh, can't quite afford the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, a long way down the list. Uh, but maybe that's just what he's declared. I'm not sure, $3.5 billion. So. So I just thought I'd keep the theme of uh, hanging, uh, hanging um, some dirt on the president there. If we start to think about the landscape, the coastal landscape, a way of really articulating that quite clearly, and Adam's point about talking to politicians and to community, and this picks up on the plenary this morning, we have coastal fisheries, species that actually move across this coastal landscape. So this is the mangrove jack. The mangrove jack is a... Uh, prized fish, uh, very, very tasty fish, and farmers, these sugarcane farmers, they go and target this species. When you talk to the farmers, sugarcane farmers, about the connectivity of the landscape, you talk about mangrove jack and, and they really start to listen to the messages when you describe that this fish species has the need to move across this landscape. If you break or destroy any stage in that uh, in, that, in that seascape, you're going to affect the production of that fishery. So the, the connection across the, the freshwater out to the reef is really, really important for, um, for those important fish species. 
So let's look at some data. And fortunately, we have uh, around about almost 20 years' worth of fish data across the Burdekin floodplain. So the Burdekin floodplain is almost the largest catchment, I guess, draining into the Great Barrier Reef. It's in the sort of the, the middle region of, of the, the GBR. In the 1980s, mid-1980s, uh, a dam was put in the upper catchment, uh, and that was in place to assist the expansion of what is now really Australia's largest sugarcane production precinct. This is on the Burdekin Delta, the Burdekin floodplain. Incredibly large uh, sugarcane area, lots of connected uh, channels and ditches that deliver water from the dam across that landscape. And so for about the last 20 years we've been working, um, looking at the fish communities across this landscape, so all those yellow dots, um, we've got some data there. Uh, and recently I've been able to go back out and resurvey some of those sites and uh, just to do a bit of a check of what the fish community has been like. If we plug all that data, it's, this is using the same methodology, the same electrofishing boat, 20 years, the boat's still there, uh, and plug that into just a simple ordination, what we found, a bit surprisingly possibly, is that there's a system-specific separation in, in the uh, fish community there. So the systems have a similar fish assemblage across that floodplain. And that is quite interesting because that links to quite a large fish database we have for our estuaries, which was published a few years ago, and that data suggested that each estuary has its own unique assemblage of fish. So I'd actually argue now that it's not just our estuaries, it's actually heading into our freshwaters, are having, they've got similar assemblages of fish and they're very, very different. The reason for that is there's, there's attributes in our estuaries and our, our freshwater areas that's driving that assemblage. So we looked at that and using uh, regression tree analysis and, and looked at a whole range of uh, variables we threw at the, at the data, things like how turbid the water was, oxygen, uh, how connected, how many barriers were across those systems. And it's interesting when, you, when we ran the analysis, what was falling out as the most important attributes driving the fishery community across that floodplain was things like distance to the estuary or the number of barriers across that system there was driving that assemblage. Um, so we have systems that are very similar based on those characteristics. There's been effort through the NRM groups to try and restore the function, restore the connectivity across this floodplain. And there's a, a big interest on uh, putting in fish ladders and some work's been done in a couple of those systems there, which is quite interesting, but uh, they're focusing on very small uh, uh, waterways across that floodplain and I really think that the lessons that we've, we're learning from this data set is that maybe we need to look at some of our larger systems. So let's do that. Let's look at Sheep Station Creek. So Sheep Station Creek uh, historically was a seasonally uh, running river so it used to dry out in the dry season. However because of the distribution network and the sugarcane delivery of water it's now perennial. It flows all year round. That's a very big, big change in its hydrology. Very big change. So we did some survey work there in 2001. We looked at the fish assemblages across the, across the floodplain and we repeated those, uh, went to those same lagoons uh, in the last 12 months to look at some of the fish assemblage there. So here's an example of one of the, the uh, lagoons across Sheep Station Creek, looking pretty good. Uh, but remember, we're talking about a floodplain that has the largest sugarcane production in Australia. Nutrient-rich water is going down that system every day, flowing down that system every day. In 2001, it was decided to form a working group between landholders, the local government, the water board, and also the local NRM group to invest in environmental levy to maintain the creek, to go in there and to, to try and remove some of the vegetation. Now, when they miss a cycle in that, in that program, we find that we have this massive load of, of plant matter that grows in there. So it's the same photo taken a few months later. All that biomass is a huge demand on the oxygen, available oxygen in that system. It's a huge demand. What happens when that happens? The, the result of that excess um, demand on the oxygen is we have major fish gills. So summertime, very hot in the tropics, a thousand percent humidity, very, very hot. Uh, we have large fish kills and it's quite sad to see these are metre long barramundi and you know these are spawning fish that need to get back to the estuary to complete their life cycle and they're dying because of hypoxia, you know, available oxygen, very very sad to see. 
So as part of that program, so this is in Sheep Station Creek, for 20 years now they've been investing a lot of money into removing some of that vegetation and it's doing a fairly good job. Two main methods they're using there, mechanical harvesting, so physically removing the vegetation, looks pretty good. Also they're spraying, using aerial spraying, which uh, has problems in itself because you're decomposing the material and putting those nutrients and that load back of, uh, onto the oxygen uh, processes, so that's not so not so useful. With the removal of vegetation, we are now thinking the problem with that is it's a plant that uses the nutrients. So if you've got this nutrient-rich water coming down the catchment and you're removing that vegetation, that filter, maybe we're not actually going to be achieving our water quality targets coming out to the reef. So we're just about to kick off a project looking at how much vegetation should we be removing across that floodplain to get that balance. We have the other challenge um, on Sheep Station Creek. We have this delivery of, of uh, water from the Burdekin Dam through our distribution network, and that water's turbid. It's always turbid coming from the Burdekin Dam. And that turbidity is actually a really good thing. And that's a bit different to the talk yesterday where the gentleman was talking about clearing up the Brisbane River, making it blue. We actually want to keep a turbid water habitat uh, in, in our floodplain. The reason for that is we have a very nutrient-rich water supply. And you can see in this simple few days of logging oxygen, the cycling of oxygen in our turbid water and our clear water habitat, there's very, very different um, diurnal processes going on. In our turbid water habitat, we don't have a lot of submerged vegetation coming through. It's turbid water. Vegetation can't come through. So the oxygen cycling is quite low. Whereas in our clear water lagoons across the catchment, the cycling of oxygen is quite great. There's that organic material, that vegetation coming up from the bottom, which is, which is consuming oxygen. And in fact, it, we're reaching critical levels for barramundi. So we've done some laboratory testing looking at the chronic trigger value and the acute trigger value for barramundi. So what's going to affect barramundi uh, survival? And in fact, in our clear water lagoons, there are periods of the day, and this is in September, this is not the hottest time of the year, there are periods of the day in our clear water lagoons where we're actually breaching not only the chronic effects for, for barramundi, but also those acute effects, fish kills. So what we're arguing here is make the, make, keep, keep the creeks turbid right through to the estuary. I want to pivot slightly and talk about um, feral pigs. So feral pigs are another challenge that we have in our landscape. And we've been doing some work up in, in far northern Queensland, up on the Cape. I've uh, been sending out students into crocodile-infested lagoons to collect fish, put out my loggers. Thank you. Uh, there's three wetland habitats, or the types we've got here. We've got pig impacted, A, our persistent wetlands, which is B. So these are much deeper, not impacted by pigs because they're deeper, and there's crocodiles. So they tend to remain uh, quite clear. And then our fence, our, our managed wetland habitat. When we deploy our temperature loggers into those three habitats, those three wetland habitats, you can see A, B, C, our pig-impacted turbid habitat has a much warmer thermal regime as opposed to our, our deeper and our, our pig-managed wetland. So when we look at the fish that live in there, so these are, these are fish that are found all across those habitats, and we look at their acute thermal tolerance, so the point at which they start to roll over, what's the temperature point? It's around about between sort of 36 and 37 degrees. And in fact, we're reaching those levels for periods of time across the day in our pig impacted wetlands. So if we're gonna target management, certainly putting in fences around wetlands is gonna provide thermal refugia opportunities for fish. But if you've got a wetland that's persistently uh, there, it's deep, um, you know, th th those wetlands don't need, need, need any pig impact or, or fences around them. So. So those in them themselves are providing thermal refugia habitats. So to sum it up, I guess what I wanted to talk about very quickly is that well, I haven't quite heard, I think, in the talks I've seen, but absolutely critical, you need to set the vision and the expectation up front before you enter into a restoration program. Uh, and that's the experience that we've had from working with all these partners. Know the components, know the processes, because you can manage expectations. You don't get to the end of your project, walk away and expectations are, are lost or you know, ongoing maintenance opportunities are, are, are broken down there. 
In terms of the Burdekin floodplain, we need it to keep it turbid because it's so nutrient rich and the oxygen cycling is, is really, really critical. We're having periods where we're killing fish, so we need to keep it turbid. It's unusual for me to say that, but turbid is, is the solution there, definitely. And the last point is, if we're putting fences around wetlands, and the data I showed is it provides a thermal refugia opportunity for fish, that's great. But if you're a freshwater turtle and you want to move across the landscape, you can't get through those fences. So again, you need to know the processes, you need to know the values and set them up front very clearly because you may be achieving some restoration outcome, some service you're, you're trying to restore or achieve with your wetland, but it's at a compromise to another, another service. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so we've got 10 minutes. So what I, what I wanted to do um, was just to have a bit of a, um, a conversation um, about, so what we've heard there, there's some, across those, all those presentations, there's some pretty consistent themes. Themes around the importance of collaboration and agreeing values, agreeing um, indicators, and how you're actually going to achieve some of the goals that you set in your restoration projects. Um, and this applies, obviously, to any kind of a restoration project. Um, but also how we actually upscale some of this stuff. So we've got some really great um, uh, research projects and um, small-scale trials that are going on in terms of coastal and marine restoration. And we're facing, obviously, um, particularly from um, both Peter and Ian's um, presentations, much more of a global scale in terms of what we need to do, or a much larger and more national scale in terms of what we need to do to improve the um, condition and resilience of our um, ecosystems. So I just wanted to get um, you four up here. And what we might do is just spend a few minutes having a conversation, just, just, just with some ideas about how we can actually move forward in terms of um, taking these projects um, to, from, from research into management. And then I want to open it up for a couple of questions at the end that you might have that, uh, that, that Adam um, planted seeds, seeds of. So I'll just, uh, we'll, we'll have that conversation first and then we'll ask some, que um, ask some questions. I think this is the first time we've had three sessions um, at the Site Ecological Restoration of Australasia. Um, usually we have the seagrass teams because that's grass. <laughs> so, I did. so that's why it's there, right? It's sort of like terrestrial. Um, and uh, we're really grateful to be here. But I think one, one point that is that um, the sort of restoration that we're talking about is pretty new. Uh, and there's a lot of experience from terrestrial projects uh, and frameworks and guidelines. And part of my motivation to be here, and actually, you know, some of we've talked to, is we're really keen to strengthen those partnerships uh, and between with the people that are working on terrestrial systems uh, and freshwater systems um, and think about how we can tweak those tools. And I thought that was really great that you um, used the wheel. Um, and um, so it's not going to be exactly the same. Um, generally, it's generally harder, <laughs> more expensive and crock infested. Um, but um, uh, I think there's a lot to learn. So that was sort of my, my initial thoughts. Um, I echo Ian's comments. It's a fairly new space for me, marine reef restoration, and I'm putting out some ideas, hoping you'll be able to help us going forward. Yeah, thanks. I guess for me, um, working with so many end users, uh, it is very much end user driven, the research I'm doing. But it's also motivated by having the landholder willing to participate. And so we kind of, kind of get directed project sites that uh, happen where we have landholder support mightn't be necessarily in the best place, the right place, in terms of thinking about the bigger picture, but we've got to start somewhere, and I guess if you've got a willing landholder to work with us, then that's great. I don't know if that's the same in the terrestrial. I guess that's my, my point that I would love to learn from terrestrial, whether uh, that's where you're starting in those almost low-hanging fruit uh, locations. I guess one of the other things that we didn't get a um, chance to touch on is it really is about scale. So we're effective at small scales, but getting to larger scales. If you're talking about the scale of Great Barrier Reef, you're talking about 24,000 square kilometres of coral. We've already lost half of it, then half of it. 
So we're talking massive scales, and to make a meaningful impact, there's no way that we can actually start restoring the Great Barrier Reef. We can pinprick it, but we can't restore the Great Barrier Reef, not at the moment anyway. So we need to be sensible about how we're going to target the process. So as part of the RAP process, uh, the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, um, David Mead and various others have calculated we probably need somewhere in the order of 30 to 50 million corals per year for 10 years to start making a difference on some of those reefs. So that's a huge scale. We don't know how to do that yet. Um, it's probably a combination of different techniques. So if you're going to look at um, high value tourism sites that have been um, uh, cooked during bleaching events, two bleaching events, um, maybe some of the immediate returns on value and to enable some of those tourism businesses to go forward really is around fragmentation, but using thermally adapted and definitely selecting as many different genotypes as possible so you've got the possibility of some of them surviving the next bleaching event. Um, if you're talking about larger scale stuff, then some of the larval restoration work is probably going to be essential in that, in that space. But the other thing to be thinking about is um, to look at source reefs. So we know that some reefs are more valued than others in terms of natural flow of larvae. Um, so focusing on those source reefs as the key sites for restoration and starting at scales of hectares and building to kilometre square scales is probably where we need to go. We can't restore the Great Barrier Reef, but we can start to restore meaningful patches of reef that will in future create larvae for other reef systems downstream. And I think that's what we need to be focusing on. Thanks. Yeah, um, I was just going to say I think that's really important because I think um, we can't restore the barrier reef if we just focus on corals either. That's my opinion. But um, I'll just um, open it up and we can, uh, we can hear from some of you guys. So John Statton from the University of Western Australia. Um, so with seagrasses and, and seagrass restoration, there's it's not really much of a, a national strategy in, in how we're going to approach seagrass restoration, even uh, policies and even statewide sort of policies in doing this for corals and oyster reefs and, and, and wetlands. Are such strategies existing? And I know coral reefs, the head of Great Barrier Reef had a large injection of funding, but you know, the other side of the, the country is also a large um, the barrier reef as well. And so I'm just wondering, is there a national strategy that's, that's actually out there? And do you think that's a, a limiting factor create a process that um, might form a national strategy, but obviously wherever there are coral reefs, Australia is, the, has, is endowed with the second highest um, area of coral reefs in the world, just, just below that of Indonesia. And up until now, um, we had the healthiest, uh, largest stretches of coral reef systems, and the, there was inevitable loss in those decades prior to the mass bleaching events, and the mass bleaching events have just highlighted that none of these systems are immune to, immune to climate change. So we do need a national strategy for all of these things, and I think part of that whole process, we know that all these systems are interconnected, so going back to the point that others have raised, it's, it's about the interconnectivity and the biodiversity values across all of those different uh, land and seascapes that it's going to be really important to come up with a framework. There are lots of plans out there. Um, some people say government has a plan to have a plan. Some of them are really good. There's the Reef 2050 plan. There was the recent Reef Blueprint, which also talked about restoration. But I think what I'm trying to ask the audience is, I've often found those plans, whether they're national water quality guidelines or dredging guidelines, are very complicated. They might be good for scientists, but they're a bit of a barrier and I guess what I'm looking for is we're in a crisis. We've lost 70% of the oyster reefs. We've lost 50% of the coral reefs. You need a different approach. And I'm after something incentive-based where you have huge amounts of people and huge amounts of money mobilising on a crisis. And plans have a short lifetime in that space because we have to be adaptive and keep trying new things.